Shall we turn in our Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning tonight in verse 26. The angel Gabriel has come to Zacharias, the aged priest, well stricken in years, informed him that his wife, Elizabeth, was to bear a son who would be a partial fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi for the coming of Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord. Zacharias questioned the possibility of such a thing. And asking for a sign, he received one. He was stricken with dumbness until the day of the child's birth. Now, six months later, so between verse 25 and verse 26, there is a period of six months. For it was in the sixth month, that is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Lazarus. <sighs> come, come, where am I? Nazareth, Lazarus. My wife today said, honey, we need a vacation. I said, no, I'm all right. I think I agree with her. When Gabriel came to Zacharias, he told Zacharias, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God. Now, when he comes to Mary, we are told that he was sent by God. When Gabriel came to Daniel, he declared that he had been sent again by God. He was, he was a messenger from God to, to give to Daniel uh, the things that would transpire to the nation and to the city of Jerusalem. So Gabriel, an angel who stands there by God, no doubt waiting to receive his commands and his directions from the Lord. That would be an exciting position to be in. That of Gabriel standing there next to God, just waiting for the next uh, command, the next mission. Sent by God to a city of Galilee. Galilee was held in contempt by those who lived in the area of Judea in the south. They had their own accent up there. They were always considered a little different breed. Uh, even today there is a certain pride among many of the Jews who live in Jerusalem and they speak in a very snide manner concerning Jews that would live anywhere else but Jerusalem. And quite often they'll say, but what do you expect? They live in Tel Aviv. Or what do you expect? They live up in the Galilee. And, and, and it's, it, it's still by many of them a, a certain kind of a pride for Jerusalem, like this is the only place in the world to live and to be a real Jew you should be living in Jerusalem. And they really 
uh, speak uh, of those that live in America as almost apostates. <laughs> Hardly recognizing them as brothers. If they live here in the comforts of the U.S., they ought to be over there enduring the hardships of bringing birth to the nation. But it is interesting that the angel bypassed the religious center, Jerusalem, where the temple was. Sort of the capital. Bypassed Judea. Went up into the area of Galilee and unto the city of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth had a bad reputation. In fact, you remember when Andrew came to Nathaniel and he said, Come, we have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? I mean, it was a city that was just uh, of, of bad reputation, and yet that is the city to which the angel Gabriel came. And he came to a virgin who was betrothed or espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, in those days, marriage, of course, was by arrangement. They felt that a decision that important should not be left up to uh, the immature judgment of a child. In other words, you don't have enough sense in your choices when you're young. So the parents made the arrangements. And quite often the arrangements were made because the parents were friends of each other. And maybe you have a, a good friend and his wife is expecting about the same time as your wife. And so you say, why, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if you had a boy and we had a girl, we could, uh, you know, marry them off to each other then. So if that should be, they had their child, it was a girl, and we had ours, it was a boy. We'd get together and we'll say, well, let's get them engaged. And so they could be engaged, you know, when they were two years old. They'd be engaged to be married. Little kid going to kindergarten points over to that pretty little girl and says, well, I'm engaged to her, you know. Marriage by arrangement. There are probably good and bad things to say about it. But the espousal would be more equivalent to our engagement today. One year before the marriage ceremony, they entered into a full and complete commitment to each other. This year's period was known as the espousal. Now this was really next to being married. It was really considered as being married. You had everything but the conjugal rights. But it was a time of a complete commitment to each other during the period of the espousal. And once a couple had entered into the period of espousal, if you decided at that time to break it off, then it took a writing of divorce to break an espousal. You just couldn't say, well, you know, I don't want to see you anymore. You had to actually get a divorce from the espousal, though you had not yet had the actual marriage ceremony or the marriage had not yet been consummated. Now, if during the period of espousal, the groom would be killed or would die, then she would be considered as a widow. And you can read in some of the Jewish literature concerning what they called a widow who was a virgin. 
It meant that her husband-to-be died during the period of espousal, making her a widow, but yet because they had not yet had the actual marriage, she was still a virgin. And so a time in which the couple sort of prepared their hearts for each other in a complete commitment to each other prior to the marriage. It was at this time when Mary and Joseph were in this period of espousal, total commitment to each other, that the angel Gabriel came to Mary to announce to her that she was to have a child which would be the Messiah, Savior of the world. We don't really know too much about Joseph. We know the scripture says he was a righteous man. We know that he was a carpenter. And Matthew's gospel shares with us how when he first heard that Mary was pregnant, in this period of time when they were supposed to be committed completely to each other. Under the law, for Mary to violate this espoused condition, she would be stoned. Put to death. And Joseph was fighting with his emotions. Mary, no doubt, was a very beautiful person inwardly, and of course, we don't really know outwardly. You know, sometimes we want to picture everybody as, as just the, you know, perfect beauty physically, but such may not have been the case. We sort of like to dream it that way. When we see her in our minds, we see you know, just the vision of loveliness and beauty. God made us all. And you know, if God only did favors for the beautiful people, then we would feel very badly and think, well, I have no chance because God only does things for people with a lot of curly hair, you know. For the beautiful people, I'm out of luck. But the, the beauty that God sees is the inner beauty. The Bible tells the women, let your beauty not be the outward, you know, fancy hairstyles or fancy jewelry or um, fancy clothes, but let your beauty be that inner beauty of, of, of that meek and quiet spirit which before the Lord is just really beautiful. The Bible tells us that man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. surely as God saw the heart of Mary something special we'll get to that next lesson as we read of Mary just pouring out her heart in praise unto the Lord and as we study it we'll find the depth of the spiritual character of this beautiful young girl Joseph was troubled. He loved Mary. And yet he felt that he had been betrayed. Deceived. Defrauded. If he exposes her, it's certain death. 
people of Nazareth will take her out and they'll pick up stones and they'll begin to stone her until she dies. One part of him feeling betrayed wanted to do that, but the other part of him thought, can't stand the thought of her suffering that way and dying that way. I'll just write her a divorcement privately and just keep my mouth shut and go my way and forget it, you know. And while he was torn with these emotions and what he should do, one evening the angel of the Lord came to him and spoke to him and said, Hey, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She's going to have a son, and you're to call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. So Joseph took her as his wife. But here we are told, Joseph was a spouse to Mary and that he was of the house of David. Now, Matthew's gospel gives to us the genealogy of Joseph, taking us back, or bringing us forward, really, from Adam. Or does he bring us from Abraham, Matthew? I think he brings us from Abraham. Yeah, he begins uh, at Abraham and brings us through. And so we find that Joseph was of the line of David. He was a descendant of David. But being a descendant of David, he could not claim the throne of David. Because he was a descendant of David through Jeconias. And in Jeremiah chapter 22, God cursed the family of Jeconias. And declared that never should a one sit on the throne of David from the family of Jeconias. He was a wicked king. He was a bad king. And God said, that ends it for that line. No one from his line can sit upon the throne. So he was disqualified, according to God's command to Jeremiah, of becoming the king taking the throne of his father David. However, Mary, as we will find out in chapter 3, was also a descendant of David, but not through Jochanias. And thus Jesus, from both parents, had a legal right to the throne of David. Of course, Joseph wasn't his parent except as, as the people uh, thought that he was. But Mary, coming also from David, Jesus through her had the right to be the king of Israel, the king of the Jews. The virgin whose name was Mary Paul when he introduces the book to the Romans chapter 1 tells us that Jesus Christ was made of the seed of David according to the scriptures. That seed of David came through Mary.
He not only had to be the seed of David, but Jesus had to be the seed of the woman. Way back, when God spoke to Adam and Eve concerning their sin and declared the curse that would come upon man and upon the earth as a result of their sin. God gave a promise to them that the day would come when he would put enmity between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. And the serpent's seed would bruise his heel, but he would destroy his authority, his head, or authority. So the seed of the woman implies of necessity a virgin birth. Because the seed comes from the man implanting the egg or impregnating the egg. And so the seed of the woman would speak of a virgin birth and later on Isaiah said, Behold, I will give you a sign, God speaking through Isaiah, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And so to this virgin, Gabriel announces, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. He called her a highly favored one and truly that is so. She was granted really the highest privilege any human being could be granted and that is she was the instrument that God was going to use to bring his son into the world. What an honor. What a privilege. I wonder how many devout young girls in Israel had hoped that maybe they might be the instrument that God would choose. There is a strange belief among the Druze. They are a offshoot of Muslims. Only they have their own beliefs, and, and, and they're, they're an interesting people, the Druze. Interesting because the only people that know what they believe are the priest. If you're a Druze and you're not a priest, you don't even know what you believe. They don't tell the people what they believe about God. Only the priests know what they believe. The rest of the people just trust the priest. But one of the things they do believe is that the Messiah is coming, and when he is coming, they believe he is going to be born of a man. So, when you drive through the Druze villages, And you see the priest. Now, they are the only ones that know these things. And so when you see the priest, you always know a Druze priest. Because in his pants, he has a big baggy pocket hanging in the front of his pants. (laughs) Down below his knees a bit, a big baggy pocket. And that pocket is to catch the Messiah in case he's the one that God has chosen that through him the Messiah is to come or to be born. And that's one thing we always like to point out when we go over to Israel and we're driving through the Druze villages. We point out to the people on the buses that the big baggy sack in the front of the priest's pants 
um, because according to their belief, the Messiah is going to be uh, born of a man. And they are all hoping that they'll be the one. They're prepared for it. Now, you wonder, in Israel, how many young girls may in their hearts be hoping, perhaps God will choose me. The angel came to this young girl, Mary, made this announcement to her, and it is interesting to me that she didn't really answer him at first. It says when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and she considered, what kind of a greeting is this? <laughs> I mean, she just wondered what in the world is, you know, going on? What, what's he talking about? What kind of a greeting is this? And, and inasmuch as she didn't respond to him, the angel went on saying, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. The word favor there in Greek is charis, or karen, which is the Greek word for grace. You have found grace with God. Now, so many times we think that God has chosen the person because of that person's special talent or abilities or holiness or righteousness or whatever. But if God bestows upon you any blessing or favor, it is only because you have found grace with God. We all need the grace of God. I rest in the grace of God. I trust in the grace of God. And the angel declared, you have found grace in the sight of the Lord. That is, God is bestowing upon you this marvelous honor and privilege, not because you're the most deserving necessarily, but it's just God's grace towards you. Until I discovered the grace of God, I was held outside for so long from receiving the blessings of God. Because as I would honestly look at my own life, I would realize I really don't deserve to be blessed of God. You know, I love him, I, I've committed myself to him, I want to serve him, I want to do what's right, but I don't always do what's right. There are so many flaws and so many faults. And I used to just automatically excuse myself from anything that God may be wanting to do. Say, well, I understand, God, you know, I don't blame you for not choosing me. I wouldn't choose me if I were choosing either, you know. And so don't feel bad. I don't, you know, I understand. I, you know. And, and I never expected God to do anything for me because I just knew that I didn't deserve it. And I thought to be blessed of God required some kind of great uh, commitment and, and deserving on my part. Required, you know, complete sanctification, whatever that may be. And thus, I never believed God to bless me to any great extent. And thus, because I didn't believe God to bless me to any great extent, I was never blessed to any great extent. Then one day I discovered the grace of God. And I found out it wasn't my 
goodness that God was rewarding. It wasn't God saying, well, you've been pretty good this week. Let me see what I can do for you, you know. But God just loved me and wanted to bless me, though I wasn't deserving or worthy of it. And when I realized that and I just began to believe God to bless me, expect God to bless me, though I knew I didn't deserve it, God began to bless me. Now, I discovered something quite interesting. The more God blessed me, <laughs> the more I wanted to just praise him and serve him and, and love him. Man, that he could do that for me. And I don't deserve it. I know I don't, but look what he's doing for me. And, and it just caused me to be praising the Lord constantly because of his goodness to me though I knew I didn't deserve that goodness. And it seemed that the thing just sort of compounds on itself. As you learn to just trust God and believe God for his blessings on the basis of he loves me and his grace towards me. So even Mary needed the grace of God you have found grace in the sight of the Lord. And so he told her that you're going to conceive in your womb. You're to bring forth the Son. You're to call his name Jesus. You are the one that God has chosen for the special privilege of being the human instrument by which God is going to enter the world. By which the word will become flesh. You're to call his name Jesus. The name Jesus was a very popular name. That's why when you read of it in the New Testament later, they always said Jesus of Nazareth. For there was a Jesus of Bethany and a Jesus of, Gal of, of Capernaum and a Jesus of, you know, different cities. It was a popular name. For the name Jesus came from the Hebrew name Joshua. And we find the name Joshua was first given to that servant of Moses who took Moses' place once Moses died in leading the children of Israel into the promised land. His name was not originally Joshua. When he was born, his parents named him Hoshea. Hoshea means salvation. Later on, when Moses realized that he was the one that God had ordained to take Moses' place, Moses is the one who renamed him taking his name Hoshea, salvation, and adding the name of God to his name, calling him Jehoshua. That is, the Lord is salvation, or Jehovah is salvation. Now, later, that Jehoshua was, was contracted to just Jah-shua. Jah being the contraction of the name Jehovah or Yahweh. And so you read Hallelujah. Joshua. Now the Greek name for Joshua is Jesus. The name Jesus therefore means Jehovah is salvation. 
Now, that is exactly what the angel told Joseph in the dream that night. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name implies his mission. As God's salvation for man, he will save his people from their sins. And so here the angel, in announcing to her that she is going to conceive in her womb and bring forth a son, you're to call his name Jesus, Joshua, Jehoshua. Jehovah is salvation. The angel said concerning him, he will be great and be called the Son of the Highest or the Son of God. Now, today, the Jews will tell you that one of the reasons why they do not receive Jesus as the Messiah is that Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God and they said that is not a claim that the Messiah should make. The Messiah will not be the Son of God. We are looking for the Messiah now, but we're not looking for the Son of God. And you're all wrong when you say that the Messiah is the Son of God. They say the Messiah will be a man, not the Son of God. When God's people needed a Savior, when they were in the, the bondage of Egypt, God sent a man, Moses. He was a man, though anointed by God, but he was the Savior of the nation. He led them out of Egypt and brought them into the land. Therefore, when the Messiah comes, he will be like Moses, a man. For Moses said, And there shall come unto you a prophet likened unto myself, and unto him shall ye give heed. So they said the whole fallacy of the Christian faith is the declaration that Jesus is the Son of God. The Messiah is not to be the Son of God. If you will then ask them if he is a man, then how will you know he's the Messiah? They will tell you, he will lead us in the rebuilding of our temple. That's how we will know. When they first told me that, I almost had apoplexy. I said, do you realize how ripe you are for the Antichrist who is going to make a covenant with the nation? Allowing you to rebuild your temple, but in the midst of the seven-year period will break the covenant and come to the temple and proclaim himself to be God. Jesus said to them, I came to you in my Father's name. That is, I came to you declaring to you I was the Son of God, and you won't receive me. Now he said, another one is going to come in his own name. You will receive him. Tragic. Yet, Isaiah said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And yet they are disclaiming him for that very reason. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which interpreted is God with us. And so the claims of Jesus Christ as being the Son of God are perfectly consistent with the prophecies of the Messiah from the Old Testament.
Now, the angel talking to Mary concerning this son, whom she is to call Jesus, he will be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give unto him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, God promised to David that he would build David a house, and that there would never cease from David's seed one sitting upon the throne. Now that promise made to David was conditional to his sons following after God in obedience and righteousness, which they did not do. There are certain men today who try to make a uh, a, a fanciful story of, of Jeremiah taking one of the young princes and escaping to England. And that this young Jewish prince that he took to England became the king and that the present monarchy in England are direct descendants of David. And so because it's one of the last monarchies, God's promise to David is still being fulfilled. There has not ceased to be a um, descendant of David sitting upon the throne. Uh, it is a very fanciful tale indeed thoroughly lacking any kind of documentation or proof. It's just a fanciful story. But it has attracted a lot of intelligent people and a lot of people that aren't so intelligent. If you will go on and read the promises of God to. David, they were definitely conditional. But the promise that was made to David wasn't made concerning the fleshly seed, but the promise was made concerning Jesus Christ himself and of the eternal reign of Jesus. So in Isaiah chapter 9, where he talks about his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah goes on to declare, and of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David to order it and to establish it in righteousness and in judgment from henceforth even forever. From henceforth, so the same prophecy of Isaiah is now being reiterated by the angel to a Mary telling her that the son that is to be born is, a, is this one that was promised by God to sit upon the throne of the David and of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. And of his kingdom, the angel said, there will be no end. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. As the psalm said, the stone which was set of not by the builders, the same has become the chief cornerstone. This is the work of God. It's marvelous in our eyes. That stone that was set of not by the builders is coming again, and he will fulfill the promises of God in establishing the kingdom of God, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, Mary questioned Gabriel at this point. And where the question of Zacharias, and, and you know, it must be tough being an angel, nobody believes what you tell them, you know. <laughs> he came to Zacharias and he said, you know, your, your wife is going to have a child. He said, ah, come on, you know, she's an old woman. And we haven't been able to have children. How can I know this? And, and his was the, a question of unbelief. 
Mary's was not a question of unbelief. Hers was just a question of method. How can this be? I have not known a man. I have not had physical intimacy with a man. I've never had relations with a man. Very open, very frank, very honest in her questioning here. Not a doubt of, of the, what the angel has told her, but just how is it going to happen? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. That's the announcement of the angel, though the Jews today take offense at that, yet that's exactly what Gabriel told Mary. It will be through the agency of the Holy Spirit coming upon you. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the woman's egg is fertilized or made fertile by the seed from the man. Our bodies, if we have normal bodies, possessed of these chromosomes, each chromo I mean each cell has 46 chromosomes. If you have 45 or 47, then you have a physical malformity. And there are those quite often who have 47 chromosomes in the cell. But the normal cell Normal person, 46 chromosomes in the cells in your bodies. Every one of the cells in your body has 46 chromosomes, except in the male, in the sperm, there are only 23 chromosomes. And in the ovum or the egg of the woman, there is only 23 chromosomes. So when the seed of the man fertilizes the egg of the woman, you have then the complete a cell of 46 chromosomes made up of 23 from the man and 23 from the woman. Now theoretically, these part or half cells, so to speak, can have 23 of any combination of my total 46. And the same with a woman. So theoretically, it is possible to have brothers who are not at all related to each other. Very improbable, but theoretically possible, mathematically possible. And in some cases, you have brothers or sisters that look quite a bit alike and in other cases you have them that don't look at all alike because you have a different mixture of, of the 23 chromosomes and, and they didn't get the same 23 that I got, you see, and so uh, my brother and I uh, really don't look alike. We aren't built alike. And uh, that's just the difference. He has blue eyes, I have brown eyes. And he had blonde hair and I don't have any hair. <laughs> well, one time I did and it was dark. <laughs> but I picked up these genes that tended toward baldness from my mother. And um, 
It, it's just a part of, 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 you know, the way we're made up. Now, with Jesus, Mary being impregnated by the Holy Spirit, by God, Jesus became the God-man. He is God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He became a man. Evidently, the sinful nature is passed on by the man. Because Jesus was born without a sinful nature. The Bible says he came in likeness of sinful flesh. In the likeness of, not sinful flesh, but in the likeness of sinful flesh. God being his father. He did not have a sinful nature. Some people refer to Jesus as the second Adam. He's not and should not be referred to as such. He is the second man. The Bible speaks of the first Adam, but Jesus as the second man. That is the second man without a sinful nature. Adam was created by God without a sinful nature. Adam developed his sinful nature through disobedience to the command of God. The second man, Jesus, without a sinful nature. We read concerning Jesus that he was born as, or he was offered as a sacrifice without spot or blemish. A spot was an inherent defect. Maybe there was some, when the lamb was born, it had some kind of a genetic uh, uh, defect. An undeveloped leg or something. That would be a spot, a genetic defect at birth. The blemish would be an acquired defect. Maybe the lamb strayed a little bit and a wolf got hold of him, began to tear at his body and the shepherd came and drove the wolf off and then poured oil on the wounds of the lamb, but as it healed, it left a big jagged scar on it, you know. His encounter with the wolf, maybe his face is, you know, distorted now as it healed, scar tissue and all, that's a blemish. An acquired defect. Now in the offering of a lamb unto God as a sacrifice, the lamb had to be without spot or blemish. You had to take the best that you had to give to God. Don't give him some old crippled thing, some old beat up thing. And so God gave his best for us. Jesus died as a lamb without spot. That is, he did not have inherent sin nor did he have acquired sin. He was without blemish. And so God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Therefore, the sinful nature evidently is passed down through the Father. Now, the angel went on to tell Mary, for with God, she said, you know, how can this be? And the angel said, with God, nothing is impossible. Now, it is interesting to me today that there are some people who still have problems with the virgin birth. And many theologians seem to have great difficulty with the concept or the idea of the virgin birth. And in a recent poll of ministers throughout the United States, when questioned if they believed in the virgin birth, over 50% of the ministers polled declared they did not believe in the virgin birth. They had trouble with that. Well, as the angel said to Mary, with God, nothing shall be impossible. And 
All I can say for a person who has a problem with a virgin birth is that that isn't really your problem. Your problem is with your concept of God. If you have a proper concept of God, you'll have no problem with a virgin birth. If you believe a God who can call the universe into existence and create all of the life forms, I find it not at all difficult, not inconceivable, that God could by His Spirit impregnate a woman to bring forth His Son into the world that would be God in flesh, manifested in flesh. I have absolutely no problem at all in believing in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And I do believe it completely and fully. I don't even have the slightest qualm or question. Why? Because with God, all things are possible. So don't talk to me about, you know, problems of genes or whatever else. Hey! We're dealing with God, and with God all things are possible. And so with God, nothing, he said, will be impossible. And then I like this, Mary, in response to it, said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. I mean, what a beautiful submission to the plan of God. Oh, that we would be that submitted to God's plan for our lives. Now, I don't know if, if when the angel told Mary these things, she could immediately perceive, you know, the problems that it would create with Joseph. I don't know if when... Uh, through her mind went raising, man, you know, what'll happen when Joseph finds out? And, and if, if that, you know, was, if that was really a concern to her, I don't know, I don't know. Perhaps she did, perhaps she didn't. Perhaps she was just so excited uh, uh, with meeting the angel and hearing this glorious news that, hey, doesn't matter. But this beautiful... Just submission to the purpose and the plan of God. Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. Really, the slave of the Lord. Duloi. Be it unto me, even as you have said. God's will be done. If God wants to use me in this capacity... My life is his. I'm his servant. And oh, that we would take that kind of a commitment ourselves to the will and the purpose of God for our lives. Here I am. I'm here to serve the Lord in whatever way, whatever capacity he might require. Let it be to me according to his word. Next week, we'll find now the meeting of Mary and Elizabeth. Elizabeth was a relative. It, in the Greek, it is kinswoman. The King James says cousin, but we don't know a cousin necessarily, just a kinswoman. She was part of the family, some relationship to Mary. Father, we thank you now for this privilege of learning about Jesus, our Lord. Learning about your plan that you set in motion. Learning of your grace in reaching down to touch man. Speaking to man through your Son. God, speak to us tonight. And may our hearts respond even as did Mary's. Lord, I'm here to serve you. Be it unto me according to your word. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.